This is the 29th message in a series on the subject of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been tracing his footsteps from even before he came to Bethlehem, when he lay in the fellowship and in the bosom of the Father, down through the incarnation, the virgin birth, his sinless life, his ministry, his teaching, his miracles, his works, and now through Gethsemane to the Judgment Hall and on to Calvary. Tonight's message is in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verse 1 through 15. And straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus and carried him away, and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye that, that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Down through the years of history, many men have died, and many men have died for good causes. Some have died as a sacrifice to save the lives of others. Men have died for high ideals, died for the things that they believed in. Some have died for honor. Some have died in the dignity of patriotism. Some have died in exchange for the lives of others. But of all the men who have died and whose deaths are recorded in history, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is unique. I mean by that it is one of a kind, Never before in the history of the world did a man die like Jesus died. There is abundant evidence and testimony in the scripture that we need not wonder about the true meaning of the death of Jesus. It is given in such simple words as Paul's when he said Christ died for our sins, or when he said the just died for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. When we read through the New Testament, we are stricken with the great truth of the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in the story of Barabbas, we see perhaps the simplest and plainest illustration of what the death of Calvary means to sinners. I've been convicted lately, as I've been thinking about it in my own heart, of a tendency, and I think this tendency is true among all Christians, to rather complicate the cross as we go along in our thinking or in our talking to others. And if we don't complicate it, at least we look over its simplicity and we talk about it in such a way, assuming that others understand perfectly well what it means. And I think we should be very careful and very cautious when we are talking to others about the death of Christ, that we use the simplest kind of language, the plainest kind of words, and impress upon the hearts of those we speak to about the personal implications of the cross. It is true that great, mighty, and eternal things were accomplished in the cross, so great 
are some of the eternal purposes hidden in the work of Calvary, that we will never quite understand them nor comprehend them, even when we see them face to face. But the thing that matters is made plain in the pages of the scriptures. What matters is that Jesus went to the cross to die in the place of sinners. This is good news for sinners only. It is not good news for those who consider themselves above and beyond the need of such salvation. But for all who are sinners, there is good news in the cross of Calvary. Jesus died for you. I know I've repeated this many times, but it still is fitting and proper to remind you that when Charles Haddon Spurgeon lay dying, supposedly called the Prince of Preachers, supposedly a master theologian, he uttered this dying testimony, all my theology is found in these words, Jesus died for me. And in all that he had learned and in all that he had studied, in all that he had written and in all that he had believed, he found it all condensed in these four words, Jesus died for me. And unless men know this for themselves, they be lost eternally. This is the essence of the gospel, and it is the saving faith that lays hold of the personal participation in the death of Christ. First of all, I can't help but comment before we go on to Barabbas. The hideous and horrible crime of the people in rejecting Jesus and choosing Barabbas. As you will hear about this man in a moment, he was a notorious criminal. His deeds were well known to the public. He was not only a robber, a bandit, but he was also a rebel against all authority and had led others in insurrection and in the leading of this insurrection had also committed murder. There was no sin too black and too great for Barabbas. He had committed the whole octave of sin and the people full well knew it for he was notorious in his out and out criminal activities not only against Rome, but against society itself. I think this was perhaps the reason why he was chosen by Pilate to be placed in direct contrast with the Lord Jesus. Pilate, you see, in reality, would like to have let him go. He would like to have released the Lord if he could have found some grounds to do so. And this seemed to him a perfect way, a foolproof way, but there was one thing that I know, and one thing that God's Word knows, and one thing that you know if you've read God's Word that Pilate didn't know. He didn't know about the corrupt and totally depraved nature of the human race. And he didn't know that man loved darkness rather than light. And he didn't know that men hated righteousness and loved unrighteousness. And he didn't know that if he stood Barabbas beside Jesus, that the whole human race, if they could have voted on it, would have taken Barabbas instead of Jesus. Here on Pilate's left, we'll say, stands Barabbas. Guilty as charged and condemned, with the bloody hands of a murderer, a heart of larceny, a heart of rebellion against all authority, and here stands Jesus. Jesus who does not even answer a word in his own behalf. One look at the Lord Jesus Christ ought to have melted the hearts of every man and woman who saw him standing there. His face is beaten, bruised, swollen, bloody. The spittle from the humiliation before the Sanhedrin still mingles with the blood upon his face. He's not pleading for mercy, not testifying in his own behalf, standing there as Isaiah said he would, dumb like a lamb before his shears. But they knew him too. He was rather notorious. They couldn't have hated him for his deeds because the only thing he ever did was good. 
He healed those who were crippled and opened the eyes of blind. Many throughout that region now walk because Jesus came by. Lepers had been cured. Even the dead had been raised and restored to life. He had asked nothing for himself. He had never taken anything from the people. He had stolen nothing. He had killed no one. He had never sought to destroy authority, but only to establish it and honor it. They couldn't have hated him for his deeds, for he had the reputation of going around over the provinces doing good. Multitudes who were hungry, when they sat to hear him teach, saw him take a little boy's lunch and break it and multiply it and bless it and give it to those who were hungry. Compassion never had a meaning until the Lord Jesus came into the human race and the word others wasn't even in their vocabulary until he lived. And they couldn't have hated him for his words, for everything he taught was of the highest moral and ethical standard. He didn't teach that men should have a right to go out and kill and steal as Barabbas did. He taught that men should be law-abiding and should give to Caesar what belonged to Caesar and should give to God what belonged to him. He taught that men should love their neighbors as themselves and live in peace with one another and to love the Lord their God with all their hearts and souls and minds and strength. There was nothing wrong with his teaching and there was nothing wrong with the way he lived. He lived in complete selflessness. He lived for others. Often he had not even a place to lay his head. Often he even went without his meals that he might minister to the needy hearts of others, such as he did in the case of the woman at the well of Samaria. Sacrifice was a word which described the entire life of the Lord Jesus. Kind, benevolent, good, understanding, compassionate, and the only one who ever walked and who ever lived who could say to the entire world, which one of you convicted me of sin. And he would not have been in Pilate's judgment hall that day had it not been for the perjured testimonies of others against him. So faultless and so sinless was his life. I don't know whether you ever thought of this. They couldn't tell the truth about him and get him convicted. They had to tell lies about him. Oh, I've been thinking about that. Any one of us could be convicted on the truth at any given time, but not him. Truth could not convict him, for he was the truth. It took lies, lies about him, to convict him. Here he stands, and here stands Barabbas. And they preferred this wretch, this wicked, open, ungodly sinner, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've wondered today what the rejectors of Christ prefer tonight instead of Jesus. The choice is still being made, and the human race is still making it. And men are still preferring some wretched sin, some wretched way of life, some wretched idea, some wretched doctrine to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now let us take a look at Barabbas. As you probably know, without even much of a knowledge at all about the meaning of word, the name Barabbas means son of the father or son of the master or son of the rabbi. And uh, tradition verifies it that Barabbas was the wayward son of a Jewish rabbi. The fate to which he hastens could not have been due to his background, but as is the case, oftentimes, the better the background, the deeper the sin. And it must ever be so because God must demonstrate and God must show that men are depraved by nature and not because of environmental background. So we have the son of a priest, gone astray in life, a murderer, a heretic, a blasphemer, a robber, a revolutionary, a rebel against all instituted authority, caught finally in his sins, red-handed as it were, convicted 
condemned, bound, and placed in the prison, waiting nothing but his own execution. He was guilty, there was no question about it, his trial was already over. He'd been found guilty on three counts, as the scripture records, and he lay in his dark prison cell waiting for the morrow when he would die upon one of three crosses which were even then being prepared in the courtyard outside. Barabbas is in a terrible situation. He's not only confined in prison, he's bound, completely helpless, so that he cannot help himself. And the scripture tells us that he is also with others who were with him in the insurrection. But alas and alack, they are also bound and in just as desperate circumstances as he, so that he is despaired of all hope in any other man. And then we read in the scriptures that he was already condemned. And there were several things that Barabbas knew. He knew, first of all, how he was to die, for crucifixion was the common form of execution for criminals as notorious as he. Undoubtedly, he'd been to crucifixions before because they were common. In fact, a few years later when Rome was overrun, or when uh, Jerusalem was overrun by the Roman soldiers, there were 500 Jews crucified in one day outside the streets of Jerusalem. And crucifixion was a very common experience under Roman rule. And Barabbas knew full well the agonies of that crucifixion and what lay ahead for him. I think Barabbas must have known when he would die because those crosses were most generally prepared in the courtyard right outside those prison cells so that the prisoners could look through the bars if they had any desire to do so and see the very cross upon which they would die. He knew also where he would die for Calvary was the place of crucifixion and it had earned such a horrible name as the place of a skull. He knew several things about Jesus. Jesus was probably much more notorious than Barabbas ever hoped to be. His name had been repeated in every province. His fame, as you will read in the Gospels, spread far and wide. The stories of his miracles, the stories of his healing, the stories of his ministry and of his words swept like wildfire across the country. And surely Barabbas had heard these same stories these same reports, and if he knew anything at all about the Lord Jesus, he must have known that he was sinless and innocent. First, Pilate said he was. He said, I find no fault in him, and he had washed his hands in a basin of water to demonstrate, to illustrate that great truth to the nation, that he could find no just grounds to defend, to condemn him. And not only did Pilate say so, I think the whole nation must, by their own testimony to the ministry and works of Jesus, given Barabbas reason to believe in the sinlessness and the innocency of the Lord Jesus. Now I'd like to go back for just a moment and think about Barabbas. I don't know whether you were ever in jail or not, but it must be a very unhappy experience. Now I was never in jail as a prisoner. But I have been in jail many times. And I think it is one of the most depressing places in the world, unless it would be a mental institution. When I was working in the penitentiary, I think the one word that described what I saw most often there was hopelessness. Men in whose faces you could read the hopeless circumstances of their life. Their lives had no future. They had given up to the despair of prison, resigned to their undoubtful faith, and looking about them, they saw others in the same circumstance they were in, and had despaired of hope in any man. Barabbas was in prison. He had been rightfully condemned. The death sentence had already been passed upon him. 
He lay in what corresponded to death row. He was bound in chains, shackled at the feet, shackled at the wrist. He could do nothing but lay there in his misery, in his despair, in his despondency. If he would have looked at men, he would have only been more hopeless, for all the men he could see were also bound as he was. They were also in the same prison cell, and they were also hastening out to the same death on the same kind of a cross at the same place at the same time. Here he lay in his prison cell. The night before his execution, there is a flurry of excitement as he hears strange voices, voices that can't be distinguished but the murmuring of a crowd, the shouts, he can hear the activity outside in the courtyard. He wonders why so early they have come, and he hears mingled with the shouts and with the sounds of the crowd the name of Jesus. At this moment, the name of Jesus doesn't mean much to Barabbas, but I'm sure they must have discussed it in that cell. It must be Jesus of Nazareth. Why would they be bringing him to the prison? Why would they be bringing him here? He's never done any harm. And you remember, two of Barabbas' friends died with Jesus. And one of them full well confessed that they were getting what they deserved, but this man had done nothing. And I'm sure if he knew as much, Barabbas must have known as much too. And I heard him discussing in the cell why he's done nothing. Why should he be brought to prison? As the night hours go on and the dawn begins to break, Barabbas lays in his cell with a cold, clammy fear upon his heart, for the hours of his life are numbered. He can hear the guard, which coming down the corridor, he can hear the key and the grating of the lock, the opening of the door, the voice of the guard, your time has come. They're led blinking out into the courtyard and into the sunlight. How do you suppose Barabbas must have felt when the jailer comes over and instead of taking him and leading him out to Calvary, begins to unlock the shackles of his hands and the shackles of his feet and say to him, Barabbas, you don't deserve it, but you're free. What do you mean I'm free? Another will die on your cross. Well, who would die on my cross? Jesus will die on your cross today. Jesus? But he's sinless. He's never done anything. Why should he die on my cross? Never mind, Barabbas, about that. He will die on your place. Barabbas is soon forgotten about. The cross that was made for him is now placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he begins to make his way through the city and on to Calvary, where there he will be nailed to that cross and fastened to it, and there he will die. Oh, I see Barabbas sometimes in my mind's eye, standing there stunned, shocked. They've forgotten about him now. The crowd's moving on. They're following Jesus, and they're jeering and shouting at him. And the women are coming behind him, weeping and sobbing for him. The disciples following him at a great distance heartbroken, grief-stricken, but here is Barabbas. I don't think wild horses could have kept Barabbas from the cross of Calvary that day. I think he had to go to Calvary, and I think he had to see what took place there. I see him coming along now on the edge of the crowd, trying to get a glimpse of Jesus, trying to just see him one time, this man who will die on his cross. Perhaps he never really sees him until they get to Calvary. And there where Jesus is nailed on the cross, and that cross picked up and the base of it thumped into the rock socket of that horrible rock cliff called the place of a skull. There when he is lifted up, Barabbas sees for the first time this man who dies in his place and in his stead. Barabbas knows several things. He knows he doesn't deserve the grace he has obtained. He knows one thing, he is not worthy of the mercy that has been shown him. 
He knows he is not worthy to even mention the precious name of him who died in his place instead. Barabbas wasn't any theologian, and he couldn't have answered any hard questions about the scriptures. But let me tell you something. He believed in the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing complicated to him about the cross of Calvary. Nothing hard to understand about why Jesus hung on that cross. Pure grace had put him in his place. Pure mercy enabled him to stand there free and watch another take his death. He knew full well that if Jesus was delivered, he would be released. If he was to be free, Christ must be destroyed. And those were the words used by the people. Let him be destroyed. Barabbas knew full well that if the death that had been passed upon him passed from him, it must of necessity be passed upon another. There was one man who didn't want to see Jesus come down from the cross. It was not John and it was not Peter. It was not Bartholomew and it was not Andrew. It was Barabbas. Barabbas knew that if Christ came down, he must go up. He knew that if Jesus does not finish on that cross what belongs to him, then it remains for him to finish. And I think there was one man whose heart was filled with fear when he heard the crowd say, come down and save thyself and us. And I've often imagined Barabbas standing at the edge of the crowd saying under his breath, no, no, don't come down, don't come down, for if thou dost come down, I must go up. I think he was filled with trembling when the chief priest who might have stopped that execution come by and said, if you really be the Christ, now you come down from that cross and we'll believe in you. And I believe Barabbas must have stood there again, sobbing to himself, no, no, for if you come down, I must die. That's my cross, Jesus. And if you don't occupy it, I must. He must see this thing through, and so he stands and he waits. And after six long hours, the end comes. And he hears him cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He sees his head drop, his lifeless eyes, and stare at him. And I think not until Barabbas saw that did he breathe easy. But I think when he did see that, there must have been something come over Barabbas's heart much akin to what we call peace. Do you think so? Peace. A glad relief. It's all over. Never again am I in danger of that cross. Never again will that death be mine. It's gone. It has sheathed itself in the breast of my substitute. He died for me. Rome cannot exact from me that penalty which it is now placed upon him. And I think when Jesus died, Barabbas, for the first time, was at peace about this great death which was his. Now they take Jesus down from the cross and wrap him in a winding sheet. And they put him in a barred tomb. But Barabbas is free. He can go where he will and do what he will. And I see him going down into Jerusalem, into the city streets. Notorious he was, and undoubtedly on the streets of Jerusalem many recognized him. And many must have asked, But Barabbas, last I heard of you, you were condemned. Last I heard of you, you were about to die. And the last I heard of you, you were bound and laid in a Roman prison. Now you are free. 
and you're walking the streets, and the death is gone, how did it happen? What would Barabbas say? Well, uh, one morning I decided to go to Sunday school, and that was it. Or one morning I went back to synagogue and told them I was sorry, and that was it. No, Barabbas would give them this testimony, come with me, and I will show you. They go back out the gate of the east, facing the brook Kidron, and on up to the slopes where Calvary was. And Barabbas would say, you see that cross laying there on the ground, discarded now? Yes, that's my cross. Well, how could it be your cross? You're alive. Well, it was my cross, but another died on it. You see the blood stains on it there? It should have been my blood. It was his. The death is gone because that one who was nailed to that cross took it in my place and in my stead. His name, his name is Jesus. Jesus died for me. Jesus took my place. Jesus set me free. Barabbas could rightly say, I am crucified with him. Yet I live. Yet it isn't me who lives. That is, it isn't by my power. It isn't by my strength that I live. I live because Christ loved me and he gave himself for me. Now, dear friends, Barabbas, undoubtedly, as you have already seen, is the type of the sinner. And I don't want to be too vague. I'd rather be very specific. I think when we hear this story and we read it, we should see ourselves in Barabbas. I wish I could so identify myself with every type of the sinner in the Bible, but I have a hard time with that. There are some outstanding sinners in the Bible in whose face I see my own likeness. Barabbas is one. Another I love very much, and that was that demon-possessed man. I see myself in him. Bound with the chains and naked and living in the place of death and all his activities only did one thing, and that was to hurt himself. He had so given up in despair that he felt that none could help him until Jesus came and set him free. And then I see myself in Barabbas, and I wonder if you've really seen yourself in him too. Barabbas was convicted of sin. He knew he was a murderer. He knew he was an insurrectionist, and he knew he was a robber. There are many, many people in Parkersburg tonight who don't know that. Yet God's word is plain. And in the first three chapters of Romans, that awful indictment of the human race, where good Bible readers like to read through lightly and say that's the heart of the heathen, and never arrive at the great conviction that it is the heart, their own heathen heart. Many good people have read the scriptures and have read God's testimony of the human heart and have never been able to identify themselves with it in the conviction of sin. In this awful indictment in the book of Romans, where the human heart is laid open, where God, who can see into the heart for what it is, who can see into man for what he is, tells man what he is. And if any man have ears to hear and will hear this blessed indictment of the word of God, he will be brought under condemnation that God might in turn show grace. Barabbas was convicted of sin. But how many people do you know tonight who have ever been convicted of sin? Who could ever stand and say to God, I know that in my heart I'm as much a murderer as Barabbas ever hoped to be. For Jesus said, if a man hate his brother, he is a murderer. Who can stand and say to God, who searches the heart, I'm as much of a rebel as Barabbas ever hoped to be. Because from the time I came from my mother's womb, I've gone astray in speaking lies as soon as I was born hating every government and every authority and every power that be. Oh, the rebellion of the human heart. It started when you were first just a little child. It was noticeable, so noticeable. 
No matter what your parents wanted, you wanted the opposite. And no matter what they told you, you did the opposite. Disobedience was as natural as breathing. Well, the first contact you ever had with the authority of God was in parental authority. Who knows tonight that their heart is the same as Barabbas? Murderer, rebel, robber, Mark called him. You say, I've never stolen. Yes, you have. You've robbed God of his glory. Robbed him of the thanks that belongs to him. Taken from him the joy that he wanted in you as his creature. Robbed him at every hand of all that belonged to him. If you'd been in the crowd that chose Barabbas that day, without the grace of God and the conviction of sin, you would have chosen him just as easily had that nation. Because you wouldn't have loved him any more than they loved him. And you wouldn't have desired him any more than they desired him. Who is here tonight that knows his heart is the heart of Barabbas? When I went to school in this red brick building right over yonder, it said over one door carved in stone, Know thyself. And I used to wonder what it meant. And I know tonight that to know thyself is to come into the knowledge of God's grace. For no man will ever be saved until he gets lost. And no man will ever be delivered until he finds himself with Barabbas, fate, helpless and hopeless and at the mercy and at the grace of God. You can't be saved and only be a half sinner. You can't be saved and only be half bad. You can't be saved and only be half sick with the disease of sin. You must accept God's diagnosis, recognize and plead guilty to his indictment, and not just let me impress upon you a mental assent to what God says, as I have heard so many people say, well, God says I'm a sinner, I guess I am. Often I have spoken to people about such verses as all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I've asked them such questions. Do you feel it, that you have gone astray? Do you feel that you're a sinner? Do you feel that you're lost and needy? Well, I suppose so. If God's word says so, then I suppose I am. That conviction won't ever end in saving faith. That mere mental assent is hypocrisy at its very best and blasphemy at its very worst. The conviction that brings men to Jesus is the conviction that Barabbas had. When you can feel the chains, when you can see the prison walls and they're real, when you look upon all other men for help and see them bound with the same chains and helpless like you, when you can look into the future like Barabbas did and see it as dark as the inside of a coal mine at midnight, I'm not talking about our lives, I'm talking about eternity. When a man can feel the chains of sin that bind him, feel and sense the walls of that prison in which he's encased, and see the hopelessness and the helplessness of his own unrighteous heart in the sight of God, and knows that if he lives for an eternity in that place, he will never be free, for he will be bound a thousand years from now as he is bound at this moment. Not until then. Do we know anything about the grace and the mercy of God in the Lord Jesus Christ? And not until then does the gospel become in reality what it is, and that's good news. Oh, Barabbas is quite a type of that sinner, isn't he? Condemned, helpless, no hope in man, sentence already passed, just waiting for execution. So it is with you tonight if you have not believed. He that believeth not is condemned when? Already. Sentence is passed. You're just waiting on the execution of sentence. It will come. God's in no hurry. Time means nothing to him. It's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, count on it, the judgment 
Oh, not to determine your guilt, to execute your sentence, to take you to the death that you must die, to consign you to the lake of fire where you must remain throughout eternity, not because God's mad at you, all far from it, God loves you, not because God has lost his temper with you, but because you've exhausted his patience and his long-suffering, because eternity can't wait while you play with the truth of God. He's in no hurry, he's patient, he's long-suffering, but he will not wait forever condemned already, you will hear him say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you, unless you do one thing, unless you take Barabbas' place, say to him before that day, for you will say it then, when your knee will bow and your tongue will confess, say it now, oh God, I am that sinner, guilty, condemned, and worthy of death. Oh, crucifixion would be too good for us. Hell itself seems like a relief if I thought I could escape from the presence of God. But even in hell there is no escape from his presence, for the psalmist said if he made his bed in hell, he would be there. Hell itself seems like a relief if I thought I could escape from the presence of God. But even in hell there is no escape from his presence, for the psalmist said if he made his bed in hell, he would be there. Can you take Barabbas' place tonight? If you can, then you can share Barabbas' grace. For what did Barabbas do to get saved? Well, I've never been able to find a thing here. <laughs> must have been something. Surely he must have rattled his chains in the night and told that jailer he wanted to be baptized. But I don't read it any place here. Or surely he said, I make this promise, if someone will set me free, I'll join church next week. Or surely he said, I know if I had it to do over again, I'd end up better than this. He would never have ended up any better than that had he had a thousand lives to live over again. What did he do? He didn't do anything but lay there in his misery, convicted of his sins, bound in his chains. He was laying there waiting on death. And all that came to pass in Barabbas' life came by the mercy and by the absolute sovereign grace of God himself. I don't know how to say this and make it so that I can understand it and you can understand it, but I just simply know that it's true that back yonder, in my life, I didn't do anything to get saved. In fact, the strange thing is that when I was saved, I wasn't even trying to get saved. All I was was lost and knew it. I'd been convicted of God's Holy Spirit that I was a sinner lost and doomed and damned, and I wasn't trying to get saved because I knew there wasn't any way to save myself. I tried that long before. When I was saved, I wasn't doing anything but laying in the misery of my chains and in the darkness of my prison. And I knew full well like Barabbas knew, and I think he must have known it that night. If anybody helps me, it will have to be God. And if anybody delivers me, it will have to be God through Jesus Christ. And God did deliver Barabbas, and God did deliver me. And as he delivered Barabbas, he delivered me by the same substitutionary death as this man was freed so many years ago. Oh, he didn't do a thing to get saved. And he knew one thing that he didn't deserve to be saved. And he knew something else, that God was no respecter of persons. For when he stood and watched the Lord Jesus die, he learned the truth of Romans 8.32, that God spared not his son, but delivered him up. Let me put it personal for me. He saw that not a single stripe was spared him. Not a wound was made easier. Every sin, every iniquity, every transgression laid upon him. The full 
penalty came upon Christ and the fullest of God's wrath that is due to the rejecting sinner was his portion at the cross of Calvary. Oh, Barabbas is a great type of the sinner, but he's the type of the sinner saved by grace. Because the sinner saved by grace, sinner saved completely apart from his own works and completely apart from the efforts of others, is the only man in the world who really understands and who really believes in the substitutionary death of Christ. Now, if you ask a hundred men tonight what their theories are on the death of Christ, you would hear, I suppose, at least 90 different theories, and maybe 99, and maybe a hundred. And they would say, well, I think he died to show us that we don't need to be afraid of death, you know. Or I think he died to show us that love is stronger than death, and other such nonsense. But if you ask a man who's been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will tell you what that death means. It means that he took my place. He died my death. He drank my cup. He went to my hell. He tasted my second death. He was banished from God for me. He went into outer darkness, forsaken in my place and in my stead. For you see, like Barabbas, this is the only place the soul finds real peace with God and real assurance that our sins are remembered no more against us, that they are buried as far as the east be from the west and as far and as deep as the depths of the ocean. Any sinner saved by grace can give the testimony that Barabbas gave if you would ask me tonight, how did you get free? The last time I saw you were in chains. The last time I saw you were in prison. The last time I saw you, you were condemned. At the point of death, awaiting only the execution of that day. And here you are free, enjoying life, as Barabbas must have been after this ordeal was over. And I would tell you what I'm sure he must have told others. Come with me. And I will show you. But I'll not take you to a building. And I'll not take you to an organization. And I'll not take you to a man. And I'll not take you to a creed. I'll not take you down to show you my doctrinal statement. I will take you out where Barabbas went. And I will show you the cross of Calvary. And I will say, you see that cross? On that cross, God's Son took my place. You see yonder now that blood in heaven? That blood was shed for me. He took my place. He answered to my name that day. That cross was built for me. That death destined for me. He took it all, died for me, the just for the unjust, that he might bring me to God. I would have to say to you, this is all my hope, all my peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus, and this is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, it isn't this plus other things, dear friends. It isn't this plus living a Christian life, plus holding out faithful, plus belonging, plus doing, plus morality. It is this and this alone. And if there be anything due to me from God that my Savior did not bear in my place instead, that portion remains for me throughout eternity. But tonight, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Never again will I hear my name called in judgment. And never again will my sins and my iniquities be remembered against me. My murders, my sedition, my robbing, my lying, all that I was once condemned for in the sight of God 
he bore, wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquity. Chastisement of my peace was upon him. With his stripes I have been healed. He bare my sins in his own body on a tree, and God made him to be sin for me. Though he knew no God, no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I suppose you say, well, doesn't everybody know that? <laughs> well, it seems like everybody should. <laughs> and it seems like everybody in America should know that. But the longer I live, the more convinced I am that Jesus was right when he said the multitudes, the multitudes were going to hell. You see, it isn't just, as the man told me one time, believing about God and Jesus and things like that, he said. It isn't just believing correct doctrine. It isn't just accepting a historical record. It isn't just going along with the religious crowd and say, oh, sure, I believe all those things. I've heard them many times. It is actually by the grace of God through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit going to the cross and seeing that when Jesus died, he died for you. He became the smiting place for all your wrath. He became the depository for all your sin. He became the offering that satisfied a holy God for eternity. I want to close, but there is one thing I want to say. They tell me that in the days when the sacrifices were made, they had a sacrifice for the leper that had been cleansed. You remember when the leper came to Jesus and said, you can make me clean if you will. Jesus said, I will be thou clean. And he told him, now go show yourself to the priest and make your sacrifice. Well, there was a sacrifice that a cleansed leper had to, had to make. It was a very beautiful picture of the very thing I'm talking about tonight. The leper who had been cleansed and made whole of his leprosy, which was a type of sin, carried two turtle doves with him. And when they came to the sacrificial altar, these turtle doves received at the hands of the priest, one was taken as he would wring his neck, then shed his blood and catch it in a basin. He took the other dove, which was much alive, and took the tips of his wings and dipped them in the basin of blood and let him go free. It must have been a very strange ceremony. And undoubtedly there were few who ever understood or comprehended its meaning. But the Lord Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of every perfect sacrifice. He was the reality of every shadow in every offering. And here in the offering of the turtle doves for the cleansed leper is the substitutionary atonement. Because the Lord Jesus died and because his blood was caught in a basin and because it was carried to heaven by himself and sprinkled on the mercy seat. I've had my wings dipped in his precious blood and I've been set free for eternity. This is all the cross means for me. It means much more for God. When he looks upon it, he sees so much more than I see. And I imagine when Peter looked at the cross that day Jesus died, he saw something Barabbas never saw. And I'm sure the high priest looked at it and he saw something that Barabbas never saw. And the Roman soldiers looked on it and got an entirely different understanding. But for Barabbas, it meant one thing. He died for me. And because he's there, I'm here. And because he's dead, I'm alive. And because he's bound, I'm free. And because he laid down his life, I have taken mine again. And because my crimes were laid on him, my crimes are gone. And this is all Calvary means to me. I know many people see many things. I see one thing, 
the place where Christ Jesus, my Lord, loved me and gave himself for me. What do you see in that cross tonight? This is the meaning of the table. When we come to this table to take these elements, the bread, the fruit of the vine, we do it for one reason. We do it because the Lord Jesus said to do it in remembrance of me. I impress upon you, not in the remembrance of an event, not in the remembrance of some historical happening. We're here to remember him in his death. This body and this blood which was given for us, this is our testimony at this table, that what this bread and what this grape juice signifies, the reality behind these elements is the hope of our righteousness and our peace with God. Actually, did you ever think of coming to the Lord's table as a means of confession? It's what it is. Every soul who comes to the Lord's table confesses not only to God, to every man who sees him come, that he's a poor, guilty sinner, and nothing can save him but the blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Brother Harold, will you come? Brother Fred? Howdy, will you come? Harry? Yeah. Uh -huh.